How's everyone doing? Good? Excellent. 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 Welcome to Bayside. Glad you're with us. Um, we are going to, we just kind of finished up a couple of months on our mission, and uh, we looked kind of at the internal part of our mission, making disciples in September. And then last month, in the month of October, we looked at reaching out and just loving people, loving the least of these. And I want to tell you the response uh, has been wonderful. Um, we got in um, almost 150 different responses to that mission. And so we are excited. We're going to be getting going. We've kind of begun to implement sort of this top part, and we are going to begin now kind of starting down here. So if you signed up on one of those cards over the last couple of months, I just want to encourage you, um, just be patient. It, it may not all happen this month, okay? So just have some patience. We got everybody's interest and excitement and, and where the areas are and all of that, and we'll start working on that soon. Um, but just let soon have a little bit of uh, latitude with it. So anyway, but it was just a great response. We will start next week kind of on an additional part of this, mi this mission, which is looking at kind of an international scope. And so we'll be starting uh, next Sunday morning, and for a few weeks we'll be looking at that. This morning what we are going to do, uh, because it is Communion Sunday, we are going to have, again, a focus on Jesus this morning. And last um, May we had a message on the unleavened bread, matzah, and we looked at how Jesus' body um, was like the matzah bread, and, and we focused on that. And then this morning, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the other side of that, the other half of that, which is the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed for us. And so we're going to kind of take this whole morning and look at the blood of Jesus. And blood is, a, is an interesting um, topic. It's an interesting substance itself. Um, we all know that we desperately need blood to live. And we're going to talk about that a little bit this morning. But at the same time, blood is something that can make some of us a little queasy. And if some of you are not the medical folk, um, just pray that, that it'll be okay this morning. But we are going to focus on blood, physical blood. And we're going to focus on, of course, the beautiful reality of the spiritual things that happen when Christ shed his blood on our behalf. And so we're going to look this morning um, at blood. Uh, let's open quickly just in a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you today, and again, our hearts are filled with thankfulness and with gratitude, God, for all that you've done for us. And God, so much of what you have done revolves around the cross. God, without the cross, we have nothing. We, we do not have hope. We do not have any reliance um, upon anything in ourselves um, that we could maybe be with you one day, but the cross changed all of that. God, and we know that the cross was, was the reality for your son Jesus who gave his body and shed his blood on our behalf. And that beautiful, precious blood of your son Jesus, we thank you for that this morning. God, I would ask and pray that, that you would fill our hearts with a new appreciation this morning for the blood of your son Jesus. And I also pray that we would, we would learn what it means to live in gratefulness for the blood of your son. God, we commit this to you. We thank you, praise you, adore you, and then we'll even worship you as we elevate you to the top place in our minds and our hearts this morning. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. I want to begin by asking the question, blood itself, the substance blood, is it a blessing or is it a curse? You know, there's a duality of blood that we can see very clearly in nature, and we can also see it very clearly in Scripture. You know, in a very basic sense, blood inside my body is very good. Can I get an amen? The fact that you have blood inside your body right now is a very good and needed thing for life. You don't have life if you don't have blood. And yet when blood starts to come out of my body, that same blood becomes very bad. And, and there is this duality of blood. And even this last week as I was thinking about Halloween, you know, Halloween is full of images. And if you saw any little creatures or ghouls or goblins, there most likely was some blood there. And blood is a symbol of horror. When you think of horror movies and horror stories, 
blood is a major part of that, and it consumes much of what we think of in, in a horrific sense. And at the same time, Christians around the world, those of you who are in this room this morning, will symbolically drink blood. Today, that's what we will do, and it can be some of the most holy moments that we have when we think on the blood of Jesus Christ. And so I was thinking this week, is blood a blessing or is it a curse? Is it beautiful or is it horrific? You know, I think blood, we can see it the first time clearly in Scripture through the story of God's deliverance of the children of Israel. And if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Exodus chapter 7. We have discussed this passage in the past, but let's look at this passage again. The Israelites, God's chosen children, are in bondage to Egypt. They're, they're in slavery. Pharaoh has them under his control. God wants to deliver them, and he will through Moses. But Pharaoh's heart is hardened, and so God is going to send upon Pharaoh and, and that nation plagues, ten plagues. And I want to focus on the first one and the last one this morning. And I think we'll see this duality. Um, Exodus chapter 7, let's start in verse 19. This is the first plague that God would send upon Egypt. Exodus 7 verse 19. The Lord said to Moses, Say to Aaron, take your staff and stretch out your hand over the waters of Egypt, over their rivers, their canals, and their ponds, and all their pools of water, so that they may become blood. And there shall be blood throughout all the land of Egypt, even in the vessels of wood and the vessels of stone. Moses and Aaron did as the Lord commanded. In the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants, he lifted up his staff and he struck the water of the Nile, and all the water in the Nile turned to blood. And the fish in the Nile died, and the Nile stank, so that the Egyptians could not drink water from the Nile. There was blood throughout all the land. Of Egypt. Now the interesting thing to me here is that God could have chosen to turn that water into anything. It didn't have to be blood. It could have been mud. It could have been a lot of different substances that still would have made that undrinkable. But God specifically chose to turn that water into blood. And so the first plague was a curse. He cursed the water by making it blood. A negative curse and a negative plague because of Pharaoh's hardened heart. Now, let's now go to the last plague. There would be eight plagues in the middle, frogs and lice and boils and darkness and hail and all kinds of other things that happened to Pharaoh and Egypt between this time. But now let's look at just the very last plague. Flip over a few more pages to Exodus chapter 12. Exodus 12. Chapter 11, verse 1. Uh, well, let's go to this. There we go. 11, verse 1 just says that it's going to happen. Let's read 12, starting in verse 12. This is the final plague. Now look at blood's use here. Again, getting at this duality. Exodus 12, verse 12. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night. This is the plague of the death of the firstborn, the angel of death that will come and kill all the firstborn, man and animals. And I will strike all the firstborn of the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and on all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. When I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. The children of Israel were told, were told to kill a lamb and to take that lamb's blood and put it on the doorpost and the lintel, the sides and the top. And, and when God would see that blood that was on that part of the doorpost, then he would know they are my children. They are mine. So this lamb gave up his life, his blood, so that the children of Israel would be saved. So this blood then became a saving sign for the children of Israel. Same story, two very different outcomes and two very different uses of blood. Blood on one hand was a curse. It was a plague. Blood on the other hand was a saving instrument and a sign that God used. You know, on Wednesday nights, we've been studying the book of Revelation. And this book has caused me to think about blood in very different ways. I, I looked this past week at the number of times blood is spoken of 19 times in the book of Revelation. And of those 19 times, a third of them, it speaks of the positive aspects of blood. It says, these saints during the end times will conquer their enemies because of the blood of the Lamb. 
And then in the next sentence, blood is used, or next chapter, blood is used as a curse. And, and so two-thirds of the time, when it's talking about blood in the book of Revelation, it's used in a very negative sense. God curses, again, the water. The moon becomes blood. There is blood that is spilling into the streets because of the death of many of the saints. The reality is blood can be a blessing or a curse. It can be both, depending on your relationship with God. The blood can be a blessing or a curse depending on your relationship or my relationship to God. If I have Christ's blood inside of me, if I have trusted that Jesus Christ did what he did on the cross, what we're going to remember today, blood is a blessing. If I have not trusted in Jesus Christ, and before I trusted in Jesus Christ, I was under a curse. I was under a plague because of my sin. Blood can be both a blessing or a curse. If you have never received Christ as your Savior, if you've never realized that when He died on the cross and He he shed His very blood for you, if you've never trusted in that as your only means of salvation, then I want to tell you this morning you're on the wrong side of that blood. You're on the wrong side of it. And until you or I do, we are we have all sinned and fallen short of God's glory. But when we receive Christ into our lives through faith, all of a sudden, that blood becomes a blessing. So how did this work? How does Christ's blood save me from all my sin? This is the second thing I want to look at. Christ's blood and our sin. With Christ's blood and our sin, we have a physical, physical blood and a spiritual problem. I was thinking this week a lot about how did physical blood solve a spiritual problem? Because Christ shed, we believe, his physical blood. He was a real man. He was all God, all man, and he shed his physical blood. But how does that solve a spiritual problem? Because baptism, which is one of the other pictures that we have of salvation, is physical baptism, going down into physical water. But that doesn't solve a spiritual problem. Physical water doesn't solve our sin issue. That's just a reflection that we have trusted in Christ. So how did Jesus' real physical blood solve the real spiritual problem that we had? You know, Romans 3 tells us that before Christ... In the Old Testament, in the times before Jesus came, God had passed over the sins of the people. They were still sinning, and the blood of those animals and the sacrifices all throughout the Old Testament did not truly save them from their sins. God was temporarily passing over their sins, passing them over, looking past them, until Christ would come and shed his real blood. Now, what did Christ do? He came, he became the perfect final sacrifice, and his blood now cleanses us. But when did Christ's blood cleanse us? Did Christ's blood cleanse us when he took the first whip on the back? When he started to shed his blood? Did his blood cleanse us when he took the crown of thorns and, and he started to drip blood? Did that blood cleanse us? Did Christ's blood cleanse us when he took the nails? Because I don't believe any of that blood in and of itself at that moment saved us. Christ's initial first blood when he, because as a child, Christ most likely would have cut himself or tripped and fallen and shed some blood. But when and how did Christ's physical blood then save us from this spiritual problem. We have to go back to the book of Leviticus. I want to read one verse from this book of Leviticus because this gives us the answer to how Christ's physical blood and when Christ's physical blood saved us from our sins. Leviticus 17, 11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it for you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement by the life. The life is in the blood. The life of Christ was in his blood. So Christ's blood saved us when he gave his life. It is the life of Christ that he gave on our behalf. When you think about that little lamb back in in, in Egypt, when the Egyptians and, and God was trying to free his people, it wasn't the blood that saved the, the Israelites, it was the life that was given in substitution for the firstborn that saved them. 
It was the substitutionary life, and the blood was simply a sign. And so Christ's blood is a sign that he gave his life because his life is in his blood. Christ's blood solved our spiritual sin problem before God because his life was given for us, and his life is found in his blood. I did a little bit of study this week on actual blood. Every second, blood is pulsing through our veins right now as you speak. It's providing life to every part and every cell in your body. Five to six quarts of blood that we all have at all times goes through 60,000, listen to this, 60,000 miles of blood vessels. You have 60,000 miles that five to six quarts is pumping through at about three feet per second all the time. Going right now as you speak. No wonder you're tired. You're working hard on the inside. Three feet per second. Every second of every day, blood is pumping through, providing you with everything you need for life. You have 20 to 30 trillion red blood cells at any given time between there somewhere, carrying everything you need, providing you with oxygen and literally Every single thing, every cell in your body needs is supplied by the blood that you have. Those same red blood cells also help clean up any bacteria out of your body. So if there's a little toxic bacteria, the red blood cells deliver you what you need, and then they clean up a little bit of the bacteria at the same time. You also have five different types of white blood cells. Not as many, only about 1% of your blood is white blood cells. Do the math on that if you want to. But they are ready to fight infections and viruses at every moment of every day that may attack your body. Listen to this. Every cell in your body is fully dependent, 100% fully dependent upon your blood. Every cell in your body depends upon your blood to do its job. And you wouldn't have life, and I wouldn't have life, if it wasn't for the physical blood that was coursing through my veins. I cannot survive without blood. It is my life. Now think for a moment about the spiritual applications to this physical reality. Christ's blood provides us with everything that we need for life. Christ's blood cleanses us from all sin. Amen? 1 John 1, 7. Christ's blood also fights off any enemies or infections that may want to come in and attack us. Every ounce of who I am is fully dependent on upon the blood of Jesus. Every ounce of who I am spiritually is 100% fully dependent on the blood of Christ. Adrian Rogers put it this way, Jesus is to our spirit what blood is to our body. Jesus is to our spirit what physical blood is to our body. There is life in the blood. Amen? There is life. Without the blood of Jesus Christ, there is no life. Without physical blood going through my blood vessels, there is no life. I want to talk finally about the application before we take a time to remember communion. How can I this morning and how can I in my life live grateful for the blood of Christ? I have to admit something to you this morning. I take my five to six quarts of real blood for granted. How many of you woke up this morning and thanked God for your blood? Great. Then you all take your blood for granted too. We take our physical blood for granted. We don't ever really, maybe once in a while if you have a bad accident or something really happens, you might think about your blood. But when you are operating in a normal and healthy way, you, we take our blood for granted. Don't we? We don't think about it. We don't appreciate it. We don't, we, we, don't, we don't spend a lot of time focusing on it. But if we didn't have it, we wouldn't have life. This was my question to myself this week, and now it's my question for you. Do I take Christ's blood for granted? Do I take the blood of Jesus, which gave me life, for granted. I read these verses from Hebrews. I've read them many times, but I've never read them like I did this week. Turn with me if you have your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 10. 
this is a powerful text in my mind about how we can live gratefully for the blood. This is an interesting little section of Scripture because there are two times in the first few verses where they use the word since. We could also substitute because. He's going to say because or since this happened. And then because or since this happened. And then you're going to see three times where he says, let us. Let us. Let us. Let us. He's saying because of this and this, let us do this, this, and this. For those of you who like a list and you want just, Mark, don't go on a lot of stuff, but just tell me what to do. You're going to love these verses. These are verses, and I've never read them in this way before, of how we can live grateful for the blood of Jesus rather than take the blood of Jesus for granted. And I would say there are times in our lives when we take it for granted. But this is how we can live grateful. Hebrews 10, starting in verse 19. Therefore, brothers, since... If you have your own Bible, underline that first since. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. Now hang on, he's going to get to another and since, but let's pause on that for a moment. That takes us back to the Old Testament. Since we have confidence to enter the holy place, in the Old Testament temple there was two basic places. There was the holy place, and then there was the most holy place. And the most holy place, or the holy of holies, was where the Ark of the Covenant would sit. You can read Exodus 26 or, or Hebrews 9 if you want more information on that. But the picture is only the high priest would go into the holiest of holy places and once a year, and he would always take blood, and he would make atonement for the people. And there was a curtain that separated the holy place from the most holy place, or the holy of holies. And when Jesus died on the cross, that temple curtain was <laughs> top to bottom, torn in two. And what he's saying, Jesus said, was that was my body. That was top to bottom, torn in two. My body was broken for you. And that opened up access for every believer into the very presence of God and the Holy of Holies. And Hebrews 9 tells us that because of the blood, because of the blood of Jesus, this curtain has been opened. Verse 21, and since, here's our second since, underline it, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, now let's pause, it was the high priest who would go into the temple and be a mediator a go-between between between God and the people making atonement for sin. And that's what the great high priest would do. And so Jesus not only became the great high priest go-between, he became the actual sacrifice at the same time, taking down the curtain, becoming the sacrifice that they would sacrifice on that Ark of the Covenant. He became our mercy seat. He became our propitiation. He became our great high priest. He became everything in that moment of time. Since Jesus opened up access, and since he is our great high priest, now we're going to get three let us. Three times he tells us what we should do, and this is how we can live in grateful appreciation for the blood. Number one, verse 21. And since, no, verse 22. Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. And let us, verse 23, hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Verse 24, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Those three let us, those three things are lifestyle choices we can make. Now let me just tell you, we all sin. We are a sinful people. Paul called himself the chief of all sinners. I can resonate with that. I know on a daily basis I still sin. Christ's blood covers all my sin. But these three things that he is telling us to do are not sin-related. They are choice and lifestyle-related. He is saying if you want to live in grateful appreciation for the blood of Jesus, these are three ways you set up your life to not take advantage of the blood. Number one. Number one, and this was verse 22, let us draw near. Let us draw near with a heart, a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. First thing we do if we want to live in grateful appreciation for the blood of Jesus, we draw near. I've been cleansed from all sin, 1 John 1, 7. 
so I can approach God now with humble boldness. Let me ask you this. Most of us know the theology behind the curtain being torn in two. Most of us understand that doctrinally. Jesus opened up the way to the presence of God. But the question is, are we living out the doctrine that we know? Are we daily seeking the very presence of God? Are we drawing near to the Holy of Holies on a daily basis through prayer and through the Word? Are we living grateful for that doctrine that we know, which is Jesus opened up access to the Holy of Holies by His very body and through His blood? We know that doctrinally. Are we living that practically? Are we living out this amazing truth that only the high priest got to enjoy once per year? Only the high priest would enter the holiest of holy places. Jesus' body opened up access for us, and his blood was the the path so that we could experience the very presence of God himself. That's a good place for an amen. Can I get another? Am I taking the blood of Jesus for granted by not drawing near to God? Because when I don't choose to draw near to God every single day, I'm taking it for granted. I'm taking for granted the blood of Jesus Christ. All three of these areas are things that we can do and we can only do and lifestyle choices we can make only because of the blood of Jesus. Number one is to draw near. Am I drawing near? Am I feeding myself on Jesus? You know, read John chapter 6. That's our challenge for this week. John 6 says, Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no participation with me. He's saying, unless you feed yourself on me, you can't have fellowship with me. Jesus then opened up access, full access to God. And to live grateful, we must seek that and draw near to him because his blood paved the way. Second thing we do, this is verse 23. Let us hold fast. Let us hold fast. First we draw near, then we hold fast. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. That word, that that phrase hold fast literally means to hold down. To hold down something that might get away. And I was thinking about a puppy. Like a little, excitable, hyperactive puppy. Have you ever had a puppy like that? Have you ever tried to hold him down when he is really, really excited? That is really hard. That's what he's saying. He's saying, you know what? You got to hold this thing down because it's a little slippery. Because it's a little, it, it, it could move. And what do we hold down? We hold down our confession of our hope. What does that mean? That means Christ's blood was shed so that we could be sure of our salvation. And we could have a mind that is clear, and and an assurance that is solid. But we must hold that down. We must keep that in. This is, what is this doing? This is choosing not to allow our minds or our thought life to go anywhere. Choosing to hold our thought life in check. The Bible says we have the mind of Christ. Bible says to tell, take every thought captive. If a thought is leading me down a path that shouldn't lead me down, then I take that thought captive and I don't go there. Holding on to our confession is holding down our thought life so that it doesn't run rampant. Where, do our, where does our thought life many times take us? We don't allow free reign of pride in our life. We don't allow free reign of worry and fear. We don't allow free reign of bitterness and anger. We don't allow free, free reign of lust, desiring something that's, that's not for us. We don't allow free reign of greed. So we don't allow those things to just run rampant in our lives. It's not that we don't sin. It's not that we aren't tempted. But God has given us his mind, then he's given us his spirit. And so we take those thoughts and we grab a hold of them and we don't let them just run free. When we allow our minds to go anywhere and we don't hold down those thoughts, we're not living grateful for the blood. Because the blood of Jesus paid for a new mind. 
And the blood of Jesus paid for his spirit to dwell in us. The blood of Jesus changed everything. And so now our thought life, now our thought life is different. And what we believe, we will then begin to act on. Third thing, this is verse 24 and 25. This is our final point this morning before we remember the blood and body of Jesus. Third thing is to consider others. We must consider others, verse 24 and 25. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. There are two things here where we can live grateful for the blood. Number one is we meet together. Number two is we consider others. First of all, Christ's blood was shed so that we could be one body. One. We will do communion together as one body because we in Christ are one. We are no longer many. We are one in him. So the first habit we must make is the habit of getting together. Now I know very clearly I am preaching to the choir because you're here. But we must make a habit of being here. This must be our habitual action is to gather together. This is what we must do. We must be in the habit of gathering together because we're one body. That's who we are. Christ made us one. But now, this is just the first step. You did step one. I'm proud of you. But now here's step two. He doesn't just say we need to meet together. He says we need to meet together and consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. So when we gather together, we've achieved step one. Check. When we've actually thought about our brothers and sisters, how we can encourage them, then we've done step two. That is living grateful for the blood of Jesus Christ. That we gather together. That's step one. You've all done step one. You can feel good. Pat yourself on the back. Give your neighbor a high five. You're here. Step two in that is to consider others. Now you can't consider others if you're not with them. I figured that out this week. It took a lot of thought. You can't possibly stir one another up to love and good works if you're not here. Can you? You can't do it. To stir one another up to love and good works, we must gather together. And then when we gather, we got to think about each other. What could I say to this person? What verse could I give to this person? How could, I know this person's had a tough week. How could I encourage them? How could I lift them? How could I be a blessing? How could I? How could I? We must consider others. That's why this church life must be more than just Sunday morning. Because the reality is that's really hard to do on a Sunday morning. We can do a little bit of it in fellowship time, but that's why this mission and this vision is to move down. We have to move down into smaller groups so that we can be an encouragement and a stirrer upper stirrer upper of others. To love in God, love in people, and the good works that he's designed for us to do. We're going to prepare for communion and praise team can come on forward. We're going to have a few moments where we just have some time to reflect. And what I would really like you to do during this time, and please hear me, what I would really like you to do during this time is to consider those three areas. Consider those three areas. How am I doing living grateful, not taking the blood of Jesus for granted. God doesn't expect perfection, but many times he does convict us of what we should be doing. And I want to encourage you this morning, how are you doing in those three areas? Am I daily drawing near? Am I daily living out that incredible promise and access to the Holy of Holies? Am I living out that daily drawing near? And then am I holding fast? How is my thought life? Is my thought life running rampant on me? I need to grab those thoughts. And then how am I doing in gathering together and encouraging, considering other people? If Take some moments right now. One of the most beautiful things to do is to have a little time of reflection with God. Allow Him to stir you up to what you maybe could or should be doing. And then confess that. Just say, God, you know what? You're right. You know, Mark said it, but you're right. 
I haven't been doing this. Come to agreement with God on that. Confess that. Agree with Him on that. And then let His Holy Spirit just rain down some beautiful peace and some beautiful assurance that you're His. That God's a good Father. He's not, he doesn't want to just hammer us into the ground. That's not His goal. He died so that we could have life. So take these moments and consider those three areas. And then Pastor Thomas is going to come up and we're gonna, he's going to lead us in a time of communion. So just take a few moments and talk with God. this time we are going to participate and partake in communion and when we do this we are proclaiming the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and you don't need to be a member here at Bayside uh, you could have walked in here for the very first time but if you've proclaimed that Christ is your Lord and Savior we encourage you to participate with us as we reflect on what Christ did in breaking his body and shedding his blood for our sins. And so we start by taking the bread and then we'll, we'll take the cup. And we do those, we gather and we, we pass those out uh, individually and then we will take together one in Christ. We will participate in this together because we are the body of Christ. Let's pray for the bread. God, we thank you for all that you are to us, Lord. Father in heaven, you are a great and mighty God. King above all kings, Lord above all lords. And you are our Father. And God, we thank you. And we are grateful that you gave us your Son. And we just praise you and thank you this morning. And we remember what he did in going to the cross. And that his body was broken for us. And so we do this, and we partake in this bread in remembrance of him. It's in the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, Paul writes about the Lord's Supper. And he says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. God, we are so grateful, again, for the life of Jesus Christ, for the fact that he bared the cross and he carried his cross, that he shed his blood, and ultimately that he died. We just praise you, God, in that. You are sovereign. Because when things don't make sense to us, Lord, we just trust in you. And we thank you, God, that you provided a way to draw us back to you through the blood and the death of Jesus Christ. And so we remember that blood 
today. In Jesus' name, amen. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Would you please stand as we close our service this morning? I just want to close with reading again through this section of scripture that Mark just talked about. And I really just want to encourage us this morning to, uh, to not only listen and hear the word, but to be doers of the word. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he has opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Draw near, hold fast, and consider others this week. God bless and have a great day.